We're good? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving up a bit of your time on your Saturday morning to do our first ever virtual tasting event. Now, we've, we've sent all your packs. I'm really hoping they've all arrived with you. I apologize if they've not, but you can rewatch this cupping uh, later at a later date and join in then. But um, everyone should be at the same point. Uh, we sent out instructions on what to do before the event starts. So I'm hoping you've all got your coffee weighed out into your bowls and they're arranged in the same order as I've got here. Those of you hand grinding, I've also requested that you grind ahead of time because it'll take a little bit more time. So you might not be able to catch up uh, to where we're at those using an electric grinder. So I'm gonna use a Vilfus Fart grinder. Um, we've also sent around a little guide on where to set your grinder for cupping. Um, so it's different settings based on what model you've got, whether, that, whether that's hand grinder, whether that's an electric grinder, whatever it might be. But if you're using something that we, I haven't sent a guide for, I would set it to between where you would be for an AeroPress or a single cup V60. We're only uh, brewing 10 grams of coffee here and there's not a whole lot of interaction. There's a little agitation, but not much. So a fine grind is really quite necessary for cupping. So we're gonna, we're gonna dive straight and we're gonna grind the coffees. We're gonna talk through the process of how to actually cup and taste coffee. Look at how we uh, analyze flavors in the cup, aromas, all of those kind of things. And then whilst the bowls are cooling, we're gonna discuss our roasting approach here at Workshop Coffee. And then when we're tasting, we're gonna, again, go through everything. I would love it if you put in some of your experiences in the live chat. We've got a team on hand who are gonna answer any questions you have, any troubles, any uh, positives, any negatives. So, so throw in any questions in there and we'll be, we'll be answering as we go. Um, and then after we've tasted, we'll break down a little bit about what the coffees are in a bit more detail. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our sourcing approach here as well. Um, so we're gonna go straight into it, let's, let's grind. First coffee should be Felipe Abad, number one. Coffee number two is Yuli Rosibel Parades. Coffee number three is Yolanda Cabrera. And the last on the table is Mahembe. So you should have some nice uh, water to brew these coffees with. If you're using just what's from the tap, that's absolutely fine. But think of your water kind of like your hi-fi setup. If you put the best music in the world on, but your speakers just churn out bass with no tweeters or high end, it's not gonna be the same experience as something with good clarity. So nice water allows you to taste everything in the coffee without muddying it, buffering acidity, changing their overall flavor balance. So I'm, I'm using the water that we have filtered here at the roastery. Um, I'm gonna set it off to boil whilst we have a little smell. The first stage in coffee tasting is what do we get in the dry aroma of the coffee? So it's called the fragrance. And this is basically gonna be all the very delicate fleeting aromas that are volatile enough to come out just with having the coffee ground. Personally, I find that a really nice long draw works, but also lots of short little sharp sniffs is also a really good way to get as much aromatic intensity out of the coffee as you can. So, Felipe Abad is an interesting one for me. This, this is a coffee from Ecuador and it's a Caturo variety. And I always get a mixture of kind of cocoa and herbal notes in it. It's, it's very, very pleasing, very delicate, and, and also a lot of tea notes. Um, these come a little bit more pronounced in the cup. We'll see how they present today but very comforting, very enjoyable. Yuli Rosabel Parades, a little bit different. Much more sort of fruity, a lot of apple aromas. And yeah, very fragrant, but bordering into floral as well. And then the reason I wanted to put Yolanda at the end here, normally I would put a Peruvian coffee at the, uh, the front of the table because they can be a bit richer and a bit rounder, but 
Yolanda's coffee is crazy. It's, it's very, very playful, very aromatic, um, very jammy. So I, I didn't want to sort of mar the experience of the first two cups by having it there. So yeah, for me, really jammy and plummy in Yolanda. And then Mahembe, I, I love this coffee so much and it's, it's really, really elegant. It's got a lot of like honey and floral tones to it and just tons of stone fruit and squeaky clean. The, 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 the cleanliness is something we're going to talk about a little bit when we talk about roasting as well as sourcing. Um, so coffees are ground. I'll give you a little bit of time in case you're still grinding or, or your kettles are boiling <clears throat> before we jump in. I'm using a, a pouring kettle here that's designed for making pour over coffee. It's absolutely not necessary in a cupping scenario. Um, I'm just doing this in case I over pour and have to, have to uh, redo it today. But a nice wide mouth kettle is, is kind of perfect for this as well. So these are our cupping bowls that we use in the roastery. They hold 10 grams of coffee to 165 grams of water. That's a ratio of about 60 grams per litre. That's typically what I'd recommend for tasting a coffee in this scenario or brewing, whether you're doing a French press or a V60. It's a great baseline. If you want to play around with your brewing and up dose or drop dose, that's absolutely fine as well. But for tasting, I think it's the best way to get <clears throat> a mixture of nice strength, nice extraction and uh, yeah, nice clarity in the cup. So I know these bowls will hold about the right amount, but I'm going to just weigh just to be doubly sure today. So take your kettle, have a timer to hand, and we're going to add in 165 grams to the 10 grams of ground coffee and press start. If there's any patches, try and make sure they get wet as well so that they're not uh, left high and dry and not extracting in the same way. And then once all the water's in, we're going to smell it again. Now that all the heat of the water has gone into the bowls, it's going to drive out different aromatic compounds. Some sort of weightier molecules that aren't coming out in this, the dry coffee itself will lift out and it might just change a little bit. Number four, Mahembe. One hundred and sixty-six. That'll do. I've got a little bowl to hand as well, just so that I can rinse my spoons for cleaning and, and if I want to dip between samples. I'm not, not too fussed about doing that today. So water is in. Let's see what aromas are being driven out now that the heat has been added to the bowls. Okay, for me they are, they're quite similar to in the dry, but just a little more pronounced. Some things have become a bit more present. Yolanda in particular has got a, a, a really pronounced sort of like cashew and dried fruit leather kind of uh, aroma happening now, which wasn't so present in the dry aroma. Philippe has just become a little bit fuller. I get a little bit of grape now as well, actually. And Yuli just, yeah. It, Yuli's got a little bit of herbal, herbal notes coming through as well. Very fragrant, not savory herbs, more sort of, well, the, the, the description we have on the bag is lemon verbena, and it's that kind of like lemon balm, very uh, citric fruity herbal note that's, um, yeah, come out a lot more now that the water's been added, actually. Mahembe just smells just like uh, nectarines to me now, really, really strong. I can get rid of my scale, don't need that anymore. Now, check out your timer. What we're going to look for is four minutes. All we need really is the coffee to steep for a little bit, but because there's a cap of foam formed on the top, we call that the crust. And the next uh, job we have to do is to break the crust. But actually at the same time, we're going to stir the bowl a little bit just to ensure Every, every ground got wet evenly and push up the extraction that little bit. If you just like delicately tap it down, it's not going to necessarily extract to the level we want that we would consider a good extraction. You can change the flavor in the cup by under extracting or over extracting and lean more towards a sour cup or a bitter cup. And what we want to create is something sweet and balanced and delicious. So we're going to give it a, a good little churn. 
And then any oil left on the top, we will just skim off so that we're able to actually slurp the brewed coffee in the cup and not have uh, oils lingering on your tongue. Some of the fine particles can also sit in that layer um, and they can just sort of block your taste buds and not allow you to taste the next coffee so clearly. So coming up to four minutes. This is a point where a lot of coppers really like to get their nose in the smell. For me, smelling the crust like this is actually a bit more um, informative than the smell on the brake, but I do like to smell it as well, just in case anything else pops out. And we always try and break at the same pace that we added the water, so they've all had a fair chance to steep for the same amount of time. I tend to just use my spittoon for the, um, the foam. To clean off the cups. So this exercise of cupping coffee is something done at origin when you're selecting lots that you might want to purchase, when we're assessing lots here that we might want to purchase, when we're assessing how a coffee might have landed, when we first get it into the roastery to get a handle on how the coffee traveled and how it, how it sort of, whether it's degraded at all in transit or opened up in transit. And again, before we want to do a test roast of the coffee. Uh, so it's a sort of universal process for just checking in on a coffee. You have to roast green coffee to analyze the green coffee potential. So we try and use a very neutral roast in the sample roasting. But actually when we profile a coffee and roast it in full scale batches on our roaster here in London, we can sort of like, experiment with different parameters to bring out the best attributes in the cup possible. So here we're using a um, Probat made roaster. It's called a P25, meaning it's rated to roast 25 kilos of coffee at a time. But if you actually put 25 kilos into it because of the burner capacity, it might not actually develop the coffee as nicely as we would like it to be. So we don't tend to max it out. We have a, a batch size for espresso roasting, which we want to be a little bit slower and a smaller batch size for filter roasting, which we want to be a little bit more zippy. So the, the, the roaster itself is, is like a big cast iron drum and after use it gets a little bit seasoned and you've got a big burner underneath it with so many different increments you can uh, change. So it's, it's being fueled with gas and air blending in and we can control how much we're burning at a time, which then heats up the drum and within the drum, the air gets very, very hot. And actually when you're roasting in a, in a spinning drum scenario, about 70% of the heat transfer is done from the air as the beans sort of tumble through it and about 30% from the drum itself. So 70% convective transfer, 30% conductive heat transfer. So it's quite tricky to get a very even color on the coffee because of the fact that some of the coffee is touching the drum. So our approach is to always try and roast as smoothly as possible. And we, and we do that through making so many incremental gas changes during the roast. What, we, what, what you can do uh, is, is roast by manipulating airflow. You can manipulate drum speed. You can manipulate all sorts of different parameters. We, we like to keep things fixed, have one fixed airflow running through the drum, have one fixed uh, drum speed spinning the coffee around but be very clever with how we apply the gas. So we have a strict between batch protocol so that every time we load coffee in, we start at the same kind of residual thermal energy within that system. We'll choose a temperature to actually load the batch into it at, and typically we'll start on a relatively modest gas setting. It's a, it's a period we call the soak, by which time we're sort of priming that green coffee, allowing it to take on a little bit of heat, but we're not driving out moisture yet. We're not doing any sort of reactions yet. We're just getting it ready to take on the energy from the roaster. And then we'll amp it up with what we call the kicker, which is a higher gas setting, and that sort of sets it off onto a certain trajectory. When you think about roasting, if, if it's going to be a 10 minute roast and you want to edit a certain temperature, that's your target. 
and how far you put your gas in is a bit like an archer. How far do you pull back the bow and how uh, high do you angle your, your, your bow? So we will set it off with the kicker and then just typically we'll reduce gas steadily throughout in an intelligent way until we get to first crack. And again, then leave it on to support the coffee through crack, which is a point where the beans uh, fracture open and sort of puff up as the, as the last bits of water vapor are sort of expelled out of that cell structure and sugars begin to caramelize and acids change. And a lot of that work is done at the tail end of the roast in what we call the development period. During all the roast, it's developing, it's changing. You're doing certain reactions, you're, you're changing the compounds and the, and the chemical structure of the coffee. But that tail end is very, very important. So we, we try and achieve an end temperature to within 0.1 Celsius. That's how accurate we want to be with our bean probe reader. Uh, we also have an exhaust probe reader, which we look at, and pressure gauges on the roaster so we can try and recreate the scenarios every time to be consistent. But getting that recipe dialed in is a bit of trial and error. We can look at the density of the green coffee, the origin of it, the variety, the processing method, the age of the crop. All of these things are going to inform us how we might approach it. We will try a batch and then as a team, we will all taste together and look for a few things. We're going to look for, well, what flavors are there in this coffee? How do we want to sort of market it and sell it to customers so they can say, well, I want to have a really fruity coffee or a really chocolatey coffee and they can delve into those flavor descriptors to choose something that they're going to enjoy. But also we're going to look at roast quality. Does it have any roast defects to it? Has it been under roasted? Is it tasting grassy? Is it tasting like oats? Uh, is it over roasted? Are we getting charred notes, smoky notes, ashy notes? Hopefully we don't ever get those in our coffees because we're being really, really strict in our quality control procedures to make sure it's always maximizing sweetness, balancing that with good acidity and all the flavors are shining through well. When it then comes to brewing coffee, one of the things that is really important to do is let the coffee rest a little bit. First few days after roasting, there's still a lot of CO2 pent up in the seeds, which needs to sort of slowly relax and degas out of the seeds. That's a problem when you're brewing because it can mean it's resisting the water coming into the cells to draw out the coffee flavoring compounds into your brew liquor, but also they can carry other aromas with them that remind us of the roasting environment. They can taste roastier for the first few days. So what you should have with you today is coffee with 11 days rest on it, which is kind of perfect for me. Seven to 14 days within that window is pretty much perfect. After that point, you might just see a little bit of aroma loss, but still gonna taste good for months and months, especially if it's sealed in a, in a bag uh, with, with nitrogen, for example, like we use, which sort of prevents any oxidation or staling of the seeds. Just gonna quickly check in on the laptop. Make sure we're all okay. I think we are good. So that's a little bit about our, 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 our roasting machine itself. Some of the other things we do is um, we, we always measure the, the green coffee weight in, but we also weigh the weight of the coffee out. You, you lose anything, let's say, between 11 and 14% of the initial weight of that batch, mainly through moisture driving out, but also some other materials burning off during the roasting process. So we always track the end weight. And then we have a, a color track measuring device where we can grind a sample of the coffee and use laser spectrometry, which sounds crazy advanced, but it's basically taking loads of pictures of that uh, puck of coffee and telling us the overall color reading. And that feeds into something interesting. What do we mean when we talk about light roasted coffee or medium roasted coffee? There's no real universal parameters for that. But if someone was really hard pushing me to say, well, how, how do we roast our coffee? I would say light to medium. It's not the lightest roaster. We're definitely not the lightest roaster. We're definitely not a dark roaster. They're light to medium. But for me, it's more important that the color of the roast is appropriate for the coffee we're using. If we're using freshly harvested, sweet, clean coffees, it doesn't make sense to me to roast them to a point where the main flavors you get are roasting flavors that you can get from roasting any coffee. If you roast any coffee to a certain level, it's going to taste the same way. Carbonized, ashy, smoky. So it doesn't make sense to do that on really pretty unique coffees with characteristics that pertain to where they're from, how they're processed and all of those kind of things. So hopefully what we'll get here is a little insight into where the coffees are from via their flavor characteristics, because we've, we've achieved a neutral roast on them. We've not imparted too much of the roasting flavor. We've allowed the coffee's characteristics to shine through that roast. And then with a good grinder and good water, you can sort of retain that value in the cup. So I'm really hoping you're following me and this is all making sense. I am maybe going to ramble a little bit here, but that, that's, that's our approach to roasting. There's, there's the physical approach, what equipment do we use, but then a more philosophical approach. We don't want to sort of mar the experience of the cup with off roast notes. 
So that involves a lot of work. We have to be very consistent in how we prime the green coffee before it even goes into the roaster. We check the moisture of every sack we receive or every vacuum packed brick of coffee. We have a conditioning room where the coffee is kept at the same temperature and relative humidity before we roast it. And that just enables us to be more consistent. So every time you buy a bag of Mahembe from us, for example, it's going to taste as good as we can possibly get it. <clears throat> we are at 13 minutes 30 on my clock. I wouldn't really even start tasting yet. And you might be thinking, why aren't we drinking the coffee? Well, we're not really drinking coffee today as much as wanting to taste it. And hot temperatures can really mask a lot of flavors, just the same way that cold temperatures can. The further away you get from the temperature of your mouth and your tongue, it's harder to taste. That's why Coca-Cola from the fridge is palatable. Room temperature Coca-Cola is hideously sweet because you're actually tasting it. It's not being masked by the cold temperature. Same with terrible wines. You can just chill them to within an inch of their life and you don't really experience the bad wine taste. With hot liquids, it's the same thing. You might get a bit more aromatic intensity, especially in the aftertaste with really hot coffee. But um, if I want to get some more of the layers in there and the nuance, they really need to come down to a more palatable temperature, more comfortable temperature even. So I would say at 15 to 16 minutes with this kind of setup is a good time to start. If we were using thicker ceramic bowls, maybe you can go a bit sooner. Um, but with glass, they don't really leach out so much heat uh, from the brew liquor. And we're only brewing 10 to 165 here. If you're using 12 grams to 200, which is a very typical cupping ratio, you might need to wait a bit longer as well. So we'll start tasting in just one moment. <clears throat> what I might do is uh, what's called a the first pass. Taste each coffee in turn, think about the flavors, and then we'll do a little debrief and then go in for the second pass. What you need to do mechanically for this cupping is use your spoon. You should have received two spoons with you so you can keep one, give one to a friend or, or use both to skim and uh, chop and change between them should you wish. Uh, we're gonna take a little sample from it and uh, slurp the coffee into our mouths and I'm gonna spit the samples out. It's still early in the day. I could definitely use the caffeine but this is 40 grams worth of caffeine and I want to drink some more coffee later today so I'm gonna limit my intake a little bit. If this was a table with 100 samples on it at Origin, it's mandatory to spit, otherwise you are going to wreck your afternoon. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spit out. The other benefit of spitting is that if you, if you drink coffee and swallow it down, the aftertaste can be really, really long, and that can uh, spill over into assessing the next sample. So we're, we're going to take a sample, I'm going to spit, feel free to drink it if you want to, um, and then we'll, get, we'll go through. So a note on slurping, it's incredibly rude to slurp at the dinner table. It's not rude to slurp at the cupping table. You don't need to be obnoxiously loud doing it, just enough to sort of spray your mouth, coat uh, your taste buds and aerate the coffee a little bit. It also helps to cool it if the co co coffee is still a little bit hot. <laughs> okay, for me, this is a very joyous thing. Having four delicious coffees on the table is great. More often than not, when we're cupping, there's a few great coffees if, if we're sample cupping and potentially buying things, and a lot of things we don't really like. And at Origin, that can be, before sort of any vetting has occurred, that can be even more bad coffees. So to, to cup such nice coffees is, is wonderful. And for me, what's nice is to have different coffees on the table because tasting things together is the best way to sort of really notice the unique flavors in each coffee because they'll be... Uh, they'll stand out against other things. If you just put one coffee down, you, you might as well just brew a cup and drink it. It's not a good tasting exercise, but having four things I think is a really nice way to start. And that's what we want to always do every, every time in the year is to have a range of about four filter coffees so you can select from. And my, my goal is to make sure they're always delicious. It's kind of hard to, to manage that in purchase planning, but um, I'll explain a little bit how we try and achieve that as well. So they're a nice temperature right now. I, I feel like they will get more expressive as they cool down, but let's, let's go through them in turn and, and see what flavors we're really getting. So Felipe Abad, first coffee on the table. In the aromas, I was saying, I got a little bit of cocoa, not, not super heavy, not really chocolatey, but just that little bit of cocoa powder, a little bit of grape. In the cup, it's, it's a softer fruit flavor for me. For me, I got a lot of pear. It, it's a very fresh, 
orchard fruit kind of thing. It's it's not uh, hugely bright in acidity. It's not crazy sweet like an, like a dried fruit or anything like that. It's like a fresh pear, um, really quite delicate and elegant. Mm. And something that we have actually written on the bag, and I, I was a little torn whether to do this or not, was to mention a minerality in the cup. Sounds incredibly pretentious, I know, but there are, there are all sorts of uh, tastes in a cup of coffee. You have sweet, you have acid, you have bitter. They're the main ones people talk about. You also have umami, you also have salt. And it's not a salty coffee. It's not briny or anything like that. And I have had coffees that are particularly salty, but there's this really interesting kind of flinty minerality to it that reminds me of like a rock oolong tea or even like a hoji cha, something with like a sort of extra sort of comforting, warming edge to it. Um, and I can't ever not taste it in the coffee. And it might not be everyone's cup of tea, excuse the pun, but for me, it it's adds an extra layer to it. It makes it really, really interesting and characteristic. Kind of like this foresty taste to it. And, and also there is, a, there is a, a, a lemon flavor in there. And I've tried to be very specific on the label with this one because it doesn't taste like fresh lemon juice. And it doesn't even really taste like uh, lemon peel or zest. It's not fragrant in the way that that is and, and bordering into floral. For me, it's, it's, I've written lemon oil, by which I mean there's a, there's a lemon flavor there, but it's, it's almost like a preserved or cooked lemon character. Uh, that you would get in, in lemon oil, where, where it doesn't have the bright acidity, it doesn't have the flaws, but it's got lemonness to it. Again, I apologize for sounding incredibly pretentious right now, but I think it's there. I want to write it on the back because I feel like it's something people can latch onto and experience as well. So, so there, there is that in there for me as well. And also by trying to describe the structure of the coffee as pristine, by that, I mean, this is an impeccably processed coffee. It's so squeaky clean. There is no trace of over ferment. It's not uh, bland that you might get with a very uh, well, a fastly fermented or, or, or an ecologically pulped and then bypass fermentation altogether coffee. There is layers to it, but it's just incredibly clean and focused. You can taste the coffee so clearly. So for me, that's an ex extremely good example of how well coffee can be processed. Second coffee on the table, let's go into next. Okay, didn't want this first on the table. And I think it needs to be the second position because suddenly you amp up acidity. We write that it, that it reminds us of sour apple candies and I'm writing hinting at them because it doesn't taste the same as uh, Warheads or, or Fantastics or whatever, whatever it is that you have as your sour candy of choice. But the type of acidity there is so zippy and fresh and lively, it's, it's, it's more uh, acid than sweet in a way. So I, I think it's more towards a sour candy. There's still bags of sweetness there, but it's so bracing that acidity, <sighs> really fresh, really lively. And it gives it a bite and a sort of mouthwatering uh, quality to it that just makes me keep wanting to go back for more. I really love this kind of profile and I can understand lots of people not wanting it, especially if you have your coffee with milk, it's not going to really stand up there. You'll, you'll lose that when you have the milk anyway. So it wouldn't really be, uh, suit you there. But I, I'm, I'm a really big fan of these kind of like high acid, bright, vibrant coffees. And again, mentioning tropical fruit, it's a very broad descriptor, kind of pineapple-y, kind of tin pineapple maybe. Um, and that and that herby edge there, it's it's almost like a sweet basil, verbena, lemon balm. I can't pinpoint it today quite so clearly actually, but there is a slight, slight herbal edge to it as well. And herbal flavors, especially in Colombian coffees, again, can be divisive. They can sometimes tend to me towards a sort of sagey, savory uh, thing, especially as the coffees fade and age out. But I don't think that's the case here. I think this is again a sort of fresh, it's not floral, but it's got this like extra aromatic layer to it. Um, so in, in the aftertaste, I get a little bit of that as well. Slight herby quality. Mm. Next, Yolanda. How's this cooling down? Now I have to be honest, this profile is, is not a standard workshop coffee profile, as in flavor profile. It's not the kind of coffee we normally try and buy because it is pretty wild. The, the flavors in there are kind of extreme. There's a, there's a really strong uh, dried fruit characteristic, bordering fermented fruit. So it's just really, really fun and playful. Lots of ripe, 
buxom, juicy, gummy, jammy fruits. Really unusual. Uh, I'm very glad to have it in the range. Um, and it does lend a lot more diversity to the range, having something like this in here. And then the last coffee on the table is the Mahembe. For me, this year's Mahembe in particular, we, we, we always try and buy at least two uh, Rwanda coffees, Gatesi and Mahembe. They're sort of household names for us now. We've worked with them for many, many years. This year's especially is just so amazing. It, it's a great example of how nice washed Rwandan coffees can be. Really, really squeaky clean, super complex, just tons of caramelly sweetness in there, but then layers of fruit, like stone fruits. You've got florals. You've got this like brisk tea character to it going on. A little bit of honey sweetness. It's really complex. I just think it's amazing coffee. And especially as it cools down, it just keeps delivering and sort of opening up more and blossoming. Tons going on here. I think this, this year's crop is fantastic. We're already gunning for uh, chasing Justin for a, a new uh, lot from Mahembe this year coming as well. So lots and lots going on in this cup. For me, delicious. I hope you like it as well. Um, now, we tasted them hot. We tasted them a bit colder. I'd love to know what kind of things you're tasting in there as well. What I do want to do is try and try and express a little bit about why the coffee might taste the way that we think it does. Now, I've talked about our roasting approach. We're trying to roast the coffee light. That's not where the flavors are coming from. The, the, the variety, the origin, the processing, they are going to all come in tandem to create these the precursors in the green coffee for it to taste a certain way. Now, two of the coffees on the table are actually the same variety. Felipe Abad and Yolanda Cabrera are both 100% Katura. Katura is a uh, dwarf uh, mutation of Bourbon. Bourbon is sort of one of the, let's call them the mother varieties that have been propagated around the world after initially coming out of Ethiopia. We have a, we have a, uh, an, we have a Bourbon on the table here actually. So Katura is, 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 a, is a mutation and it, it grows a lot shorter and squatter and it's higher yielding and it's, it's since uh, parented lots of resilient varieties because of that sort of compact nature. That's very desirable because you can plant more trees and they can be a bit more productive. Um, flavor traits are amazing, but it is a susceptible variety. It's susceptible to leaf rust and, and pests and diseases and funguses and all that kind of stuff. But the cup can be really, really good. So Felipe Abad's coffee here. His farm, Finca El Aguacatial. Sorry, sorry. It's not my strength uh, pronunciation. Aguacatial. Uh, he's growing mostly Katura on the higher elevations in the farm, about 70% is Katura, but then on the low elevations, around 30% is Katimor variety, which is a Katura derived hybrid variety with Timor hybrid, which lends a little resilience. So there's like a, a sort of bit of a safety net of a crop that is going to battle any, uh, any leaf rust that they might experience. Um, so Felipe and his wife Maria are uh, working with Caravella coffee uh, to, to develop the coffees, but then they, they will be the people who, who sell them and, and we've sourced the coffee through. Traveled to Ecuador a few times with Caravella. We've bought Felipe's coffee three times um, and it always delivers. And for me, it's, it's, uh, this year has strayed away a little bit from how it has tasted the last two seasons. What we have found in the past is that Coffees from the north in Ecuador, especially if they are typical Mejorado variety, have a very floral, elegant kind of hybrid flavor between being Ethiopian and South American coffee. Whereas from the south, where uh, Felipe is in um, uh, Zamora, Chinchipe, you can have these more like, yeah, foresty, cocoa-y, richer coffees. This year, it's way more pristine and clean and delicate and light on its feet. So it's lost a little bit of that like heavy, resinous, winey quality to it and become a little bit more ethereal and fleeting and, and delicate. And he, they're working with Caravella's PECA program on agronomical advice, so how to care for the trees, how to process. And, and um, Felipe is uh, doing, I think, 24-hour dry fermentation period after depulping the coffee before fully washing and drying on raised beds. With his microclimate and everything, that's working incredibly well, I think, here, because like I was saying before, no uh, example of over-fermentation or off-notes coming in there. Really, really pristine, clean cup. Great example of Katura. Let's jump to cup three, another Katura, this time from Peru. So Felipe's coffee, 1600 meters, I think it's 1635, his, his farm from memory. Yolanda's coffee is grown at 2200 meters, crazy high elevation. She's working totally organically, as are all of the producers with the Valle Inca Association, who we've traveled to Peru to meet with a few, um, a few years ago uh, after buying their coffee for several years. Yolanda's been working with Valle Inca for the last few years, um, and she's been doing a really unusual fermentation approach. Uh, what a lot of the Valle Inca producers are doing is depulping by hand, 
small lots at a time, and that's quite hard to manage in a large fermentation tank. So they're using barrels to manage batch sizes. They can maybe line them with grain pro or just into the barrels neat, and then they'll have a carboy on the top. So like a water lock so that as the coffee ferments and creates CO2, it pushes out oxygen. And a lot of hip roasters are selling anaerobic processed coffees. And I just hate that term. And I don't want to write it on our bags for a multitude of reasons for another video, maybe. So people might call this anaerobic processing. I call it, it's fermented in sealed bags. Um, and what's interesting with Yolanda, rather than just letting that happen at ambient temperatures, which was done the first year she worked with of our Inca, if you open the bags after a certain period, there was a lot of like really like banana, kind of alcoholic aromas to it. Not so desirable because that can really mar the clean cup profile. But what she's doing now is depulping, sealing it into bags, putting those bags into a tiled fermentation tank and feeding that with spring water, which effectively chills the, uh, the, the temperature of the fermentation throughout the day. And then at night, taking them out to so retain some of that warmth from the day from that rolling fermentation that gathers uh, pace and letting it ferment out of the tank overnight. So I think 38 hours was, was this batch. That's a pretty extended fermentation period. And what you might expect is just boozy, funky, over ferment flavors. Funky has become, again, rife in the coffee industry. If you like natural processed coffees, anaerobics, funky it becomes the, the go-to descriptor. But I don't really think it suits what's happening here. Kimchi is funky compared to cabbage, and maybe offal is funky compared to lean meats. But I don't think jam is funky compared to strawberries. It's modified and it's intensified and it's sweeter and richer and riper. And I feel like this is more the way fruit jam is to fruit than sort of funky fermented foods are to their starting ingredients. So I wouldn't use the word funky or anaerobic, but a lot of people probably would for this coffee. Uh, for me, it's a, a jammy, rich, ripe, plummy, gummy sweet playground of flavors. <laughs> Same variety as Felipe. So interesting how Katura can express very differently from the different elevations, from the different parts of the world, from different inputs and from different processing methods. Here we have from Yuli Rosa del Parades, a Castillo variety. Now, I remember when I first uh, was getting into learning about varieties, Castillo was thought of as inferior to Katura because it is a hybridized variety bred to be resistant to leaf rust. Now, I think the actual sub variety of Castillo here is Castillo El Tambo, which is more suited to the, the uh, climate in Nariño and Ancuya specifically where this is from. And I think a lot of those preconceptions about Castillo were smashed in 2015 when Astra Medina won the Cup of Excellence competition with a Castillo variety in Colombia. What they have been trying to do is understand how do you actually need to treat this variety to get better flavors in the cup. Very ripe picking was one of the things that wasn't being done initially that then started to be done and that lost some of the sort of herbal off notes that you might get from uh, a less ripe Castillo variety in the cup to this more playful, fruity, bright characteristic happening. So Nariño coffees for us have always had a bit more of a uh, fruity, tropical flavor compared to other regions like Huila. And here with the Castillo as well, yes, from a ripe picking, you do get this like tropical zippy fruit. But thankfully, it hasn't gone so far into that like overripe uh, flavor, which can give you precursors of like a, an over fermentation and also potentially age the coffee prematurely, it starts to taste metallic and, uh, and not so pleasant. So it's a little hard to tease apart the variety flavor here because there's also interwoven into that. How do you grow the plant, how do you pick the plant, how do you process it? It all feeds in together. Incredibly clean still, and just, yeah, that, that amazing acidity for me is, is just what really makes this coffee pop. So Castillo variety, don't write it off, it can be delicious. And actually a lot of really interesting processing experiments in Colombia are typically done using Castillo variety. I've had some really unusual lime process, lychee process coffees coming out of uh, Colombia, which can have like a passion fruity, yogurty flavors, and they're often done with Castillo. Lastly on the table, the Mahembe, 100% Red Bull Bon. Uh, so sixth year buying this coffee, third for, uh, second for Yolanda, third for Felipe. First time working with Yuli, but yeah, six years working with Mahembe. We've seen this coffee evolve over the years. Justin's working towards organic certification and they're doing all sorts of great social work at the washing station as well. But this isn't just from one farm. This is from a lot of smallholders growing coffee nearby to the station. <clears throat> What's interesting about Mahembe, especially this year, is when we last visited them, there had been a, a lightning strike on their washing station and it had actually exploded one of their reception tanks and taken with it their Pentagos eco pulper. They, they were using a Pentagos to, to change their fermentation and, and be a little bit leaner in, in water use and everything. And, and it definitely changed the flavors in the cup for us. When, when you use an eco pulper and you remove some of the mucilage mechanically rather than using uh, just a regular 
uh, disc depulper and letting all of the microbiome go to work on that mucilagin, break it down, you do get a different flavor in the cup. So he's now gone back for the last couple of seasons to the traditional pulper. And for me, the, the fruitiness and the complexity in the cup has increased uh, a little bit. I understand there's an extra expense in, in, in the water use and, research, and, and resource use to, to not use the eco pulper in this instance, but the flavors are fantastic. And they are doing, you know, floating and cherry sorting before the coffee comes in as well. So the way they're quality controlling is once the cherry is delivered, they are sort of refining the grades before it even goes into processing rather than uh, everyone here who's it's their own farms. So they're having that first stage of quality control in how the coffee is picked. <clears throat> so, yes, we have Katura, Katura, different processes. Castillo, don't be afraid because with the right approach to picking and processing, delicious. Um, especially with the, the the particular strain of Castillo uh, for Nariño and Rebel One from from lots of different farmers, but exceptionally processed by a well-organized wet mill, whom we're very glad and grateful to be working with year on year. I just want to double check things before we wrap up. Uh, apologies. Yes, so what we're trying to do here is an exercise in tasting, trying to delve in to think, you know, what do we exactly get in the cup? Where might that be coming from? How is the roast affecting that? How is, how is the origin of the coffee, the variety processing, all of that affecting it? This may all be a few steps ahead of where you might be at in your coffee journey. What I would recommend doing if you, if you want to, to develop some of these skills to, to assess coffee flavors and coffee quality, start small. Four coffees is a nice number, I think. Three would be fine as well. And there are great resources, and we can, we can actually link to some of these. There's, there's, there's flavor wheels, there's, there's stories about um, coffee production and sort of the journey it takes, so you can start to, to map things onto each other. And what I would recommend doing is starting with very broad strokes. So firstly, I would like to say all these coffees are, are going to be sweet for you. There'll be a sweetness in there coming from the coffee itself, not any additives. There might be some level of acidity, and if that's a, if it's fruity, you then might delve into a realm of fruit. Is it stone fruit? Is it orchard fruit? Is it berries? Uh, is it dried fruit? Has it been modified somehow? And then things like chocolate. Is it a white chocolate? Is it a milk chocolate? Is it dark chocolate? Is it cocoa powder? You can start to sort of hone in on the on the particulars after you get those broad strokes. So if, if I had to sum up in one word the coffees to start with, I might say something like um, delicate, because on the whole, this coffee is very, very delicate. All of the flavors are just like, hints and just very subtle and very very in keeping and very balanced. This one I would probably say crisp because it's got such a bite to the acidity. It's so crisp like a really bright acid crisp apple. Yolanda I'd probably say jammy because it's just that depth of fruit in there is, is very, very jammy. And then Mahembe I might say something like tart because it's got this kind of like nectarine like tartness to it, especially near the pit when it's got that really, really nice tart freshness to it. So starting with just a descriptor or, or even something summing up the style of the coffee might be a great place to start. So yes, um, three years with Felipe from Caravella. First year working with Yuli. This, this was sourced through Nordic Approach, uh, who, who we buy a lot of our coffees with. Yolanda Cabrera, we, we're working with promoting Peru to secure coffees from the Valle Inca group. And it's the second year with Yolanda. We've, we've released this coffee first of five lots we've got from uh, the last season in Peru, uh, because I feel like with this kind of intensity of uh, fruit and ferment flavor, it's going to fade sooner than the other lots. So we're sort of stacking them in a, in a sensible order. And yes, Mahembe, six years, again, partnering with Nordic Approach to source this coffee for all that time. And our general approach to sourcing is to try and find farmers whose work we admire and we can see a future of working with again and again through a transparent sourcing chain where we really love the flavors and we feel like there's potential even to develop them further. And what the, the hardest thing in a way is to, to buy the right coffees at the right time in the right volumes. Because I know when we first experience a coffee, it might be six months until we begin to roast that lot. Right now, we're at a crucial time in the year where so much coffee from the countries we like to work in has been harvested and is shipping to us. We have arrivals from Kenya just landing in. We have Nicaragua, we have El Salvador, we have Honduras, we have Guatemala. They're all within a few months of each other in harvest. And we have to stack and line up the release order of those coffees. What's going to get better as it rests out, what's going to lose its character as it rests out. And what we have to try and do is manage the range of coffees so that at any day of the year, you can go on a website and find seven coffees or so, and they all taste fresh and vibrant and characteristic and diverse. And doing that with four washed coffees is tricky enough. And one roast style, we could have, here's the light, here's the medium, here's the dark roast, here's the washed, here's the honey, here's the natural. I feel like there's so much breadth and diversity within washed coffee profiles that we don't need to do that. 
we can still have fun and diversity and, and, and an interesting range. So we have a lot of interesting coffees coming in. Felipe is the second Ecuador of the season. We had Jorge Tapia's coffee first. We have Romero Grande's coffee to roast next. Yuli came after Amparo Maya Guerrero, uh, another Colombian coffee. We might replace this with a coffee from either El Salvador or Nicaragua or Kenya, because they're just landed in turns how we get that test roast turned around. Yolanda, we have more Peru's lined up to come in afterwards. And then Mahembe, again, we might uh, we might go into to Kenya or Guatemala for this one when this finishes out. But my point here is that the range changes. There'll be a constant style and a constant level of quality that we try and pertain to. But I do think it will be interesting to come back in a few months and maybe do a summer cupping where it'll be four different coffees and we can talk again about what we're roasting and why the flavors in the cup are there and how we're trying to maximize them through the roasting. And then your job at home is to maximize them again through nice brewing. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll, we'll arrange a, a summer cupping as well. I hope you've had questions and that they've been answered nicely in the chat. Um, I really hope you liked how the coffee's tasted. And if you had a favorite, I'd love to know which one it was. But I think that is it for today. I think we've, we've gone through. I'm probably going to turn off the camera and drink at least two of these cups. I feel like that would be a shame to let them go to waste now. Um, but I really want to thank you for joining in. And, uh, and I hope you got something out of this. We, we just had our 10 year anniversary birthday at Workshop Coffee. And we would have loved to have opened our doors and invited you all in for a real in-person tasting. And we just can't do that at the moment. So this is as close as we could have to having a coffee and a chat with you. Um, so I really hope you got something out of it. And be in touch and we hope to see you soon. So take care and thank you for joining. See you soon.